Dr. Balaguru. And this session will be chaired by two of my great colleagues and good friends of me for several years, Dr. Jabaraj and Dr. Ramayashri. Both of them are uh, uh, very well-known pediatric cardiologists with their skills in decision-making and uh, providing the best support and interventions too. It was a real pleasure for adult cardiologists like me, Bhupati, Vinod, to keep ourselves uh, polished or keep us wet with uh, pediatric cardiology because of these two people. So it's my pleasure to welcome both of you, Dr. Jabaraj and Dr. Ramyashri, to take over the session from me from this point and uh, introduce the speaker and start the proceedings. Welcome, Jabaraj. The floor is yours. Yeah. Uh, thank you, um, Professor Murli and uh, Bhupati. Now I have, I take great pleasure in introducing Dr. Purusami Balaguru. He does not need any introduction in our circles, um, but still I will uh, say something on his career so far. He has, uh, he started his medical career in 1987 from Tanjavur Medical College. And then even during his uh, MBBS times, um, he has developed uh, an interest in pediatrics. And then he did his uh, DCH from Stanley Medical College, after which he went on to the UK, where he trained in a few of the famous medical centers to be a neonatologist and a pediatric pediatrician, and later on into pediatric cardiology, where, uh, which was his interest. Then he went on to the three famous universities to be trained in pediatric cardiology and intervention. New York Medical Center, then South Carolina uh, Children's uh, Hospital, finally at Boston Children's. After that, uh, he has been um, down in the South at Texas uh, Medical School. And uh, he has been a professor for the past, uh, he has been promoted to be the professor of pediatrics in 2020. Now recently he has migrated to Massachusetts General Hospital, famous Harvard University. And he has been the attending um, physician in pediatrics and pediatric cardiology. Uh, we have uh, seen him in action um, with our institute. He has been our um, visiting professor for pediatric cardiology over the past few years. And um, he has been a great speaker. He has innumerable um, uh, publications in most of the major journals. And indeed, it's a pleasure to listen to him today in this new topic on uh, hybrid interventions. I'd now ask uh, uh, my colleague Ramya to take over. Thank you, sir. I, I thank uh, my professor, Dr. Murli, who was my mentor, and uh, Dr. Bhupati and Dr. Vinod for giving me this opportunity. And uh, as like every one of uh, us here, I'm like eagerly waiting for uh, Dr. Dharaiswami Balaguru's talk over here. And uh, just a short introduction about today's talk. I think uh, we have come a long way in pediatric cardiac interventions. Like uh, without the modern interventions, most of our uh, adult, uh, most, most of our congenital heart disease uh, children would not have reached adulthood. Because of our, all our interventions, we have a significant population who has overcome that and now have reached a healthy adulthood. And as we all know, the interventions which started with just our ASPs and PDAs have come a very, very long way. Uh, of course, we have many restrictions in our intervention. You used to have restrictions in our interventions because of uh, uh, the small size of our children and the weight of the children. But uh, Hybrid interventions have made a marked difference in these interventions, which is a very healthy way of uh, coming out of our interventions. With the help of our colleague surgeons, we can do a lot of procedures, which is not feasible in the previous decades. And of course, the other topic about the premature PDAs, as we all know, uh, initially, when we all as, uh, trained as a pediatricians, the closure of PDAs, either it used to be only medical intervention with pharmacological therapy, and if it fails, the worst one will be used to be a PDA ligation. Of course, each one of us has its own contraindications. And uh, there was a still, we were in the initial phases of doing PDA uh, interventions, device closures, uh, but still we didn't have the correct hardware or gadgets for children like extremely low birth weight babies or extremely low birth babies. I think uh, sir is going to highlight us on that also. So uh, welcome, sir. We are waiting for your talk. 
Thank you very much for the generous introduction, everybody. Uh, let me share my slide. Um, I think uh, the slide is there now. Uh, so, um, actually, Dr. Jevara just really um, comprehensively told you about uh, what I have done so far. Um, am I audible very well? Yes, sir. So, okay, thank you very much. So, um, yeah, I've, um, it's been a long journey. Um, at the moment, it just I am a new guy at this Mass General Hospital, a storied institution, has been there for uh, two decades plus at this point. Um, my role um, has been uh, ma mainly in the pediatric side, Mass General Hospital for Children. That's the pediatric department is called that at this point. And uh, recently, just because in Houston, I had started doing adult congenital interventions, and therefore I also wrote the American Board and certified last year in adult congenital heart disease. So I am a um, wannabe adult congenital person at this point. Um, I was grandfathered into this uh, um, uh, board exam. Currently, they are allowing um, people who have been in the field for a while to do this exam without going through two-year fellowship program. So that's the way I got into this one. So here is um, some multiple pictures, what um, Vinod Kumar has done with us. He spent several weeks with us and he has interacted with almost every person in the team. Um, very nice guy, we, it was a pleasure having him here. And I actually, just before leaving Houston a few months ago, I was recapping a patient that uh, Vinod was in and um, he told me I was struggling to place this particular vascular plug in the venous collateral in a post-glen patient. And he was watching the case and he said, why don't you just leave it in that side posi sideways position? And um, that turned out to be a very good idea. And that kid came back for a second cat and I was thinking about Vinod in um, September, actually very last, uh, one of the few last cases that I did in Houston. And that was one of uh, cases where we took uh, Vinod's advice and got that um, case through. Um, and this is the current hospital. I just took a picture of this, um, um, the oldest part of the hospital. We have got all these new buildings built all around and the, that those new buildings are making this look small. This is just a uh, imposing building and the top, the dome, which is half hidden here is the ether dome. And that is very famous for um, administration of ether for the first time as an anesthetic in 1846. And that's being um, commemorated as World Anesthesia Day. And so the ether day in Mass General Hospital, I just joined there just a few days before this ether day was being celebrated. It is celebrated extensively on that day. In, in this hospital. So um, uh, getting into the subject of today's talk, um, I thought we will cover these things. Um, what is hybrid procedure? A few case illustrations, how we, we evolved into these procedures uh, by looking at four different situations, hypoplastic left heart syndrome, ESD closure, pulmonary atresia, bronchial stand, which is uh, a little bit of a deviation, but I ended up doing a case like this. We've done a few cases before and the results were not good. Therefore, we stopped doing them and then we restarted revisiting it. After coming to Mass General, I've done these cases. So um, as just a small segue away from cardiology into ENT, um, we'll get into that in a minute. And then um, as far time permits, very briefly about the preterm PDA closures. Um, so uh, why? hybrid procedures. This, this chart is showing us the uh, survival of patients with tetralogy of flow operated in different era. So this is all from Toronto Children's Hospital, but I'm sure this, this, this type of curve will be good for any institution in the world doing heart surgery and taking tetralogy of flow as an example. If the person had tetralogy of flow repair in the 40s and 50s, and their survival is very low, about 30% um, only survived into years of age, 50th year. And um, if you, as the years go by, the survival has become so good 
And currently, the astrology of flow, we would not expect somebody to die except for some unexpected complications. So about 3% is going is the number we will put for tetralogy of flow repair as a mortality rate. So this is the success story of congenital heart surgery and its outcome over the past 50, 60 years. Um, but still we want to improve on this. Where do we go from here? How can we better this two to 4% mortality in here? So this is a breakdown of survival for, for um, surgical patients in Boston Children's Hospital. Uh, this is an old slide, but the new slide wouldn't look any different. If you take five lesions, um, AST, VST, they're they all very good. Survival is close to 100% in most of these cases. Truncus arteriosus repair, it's not very good, especially when it is associated with aortic reg valve regurgitation um, and interrupted aortic arch. Those two really cloud the outcome in truncus arteriosus repair. And then this big one, uh, Norwood procedure for hypoplastic left heart syndrome. The best we could do is only 84%. So um, 16, 17% mortality is, is the norm. And that is not always achieved by all the institutions. This becomes a hallmark of how good the institution is in getting their surgical patients through the bit. And uh, so uh, this is a University of Texas data and it is 84% survival. So how can we improve on this 3%? So we have taken all the low hanging fruits and got this uh, outcomes high up and then now what's next? So can we avoid cardiopulmonary bypass? That's one of the uh, major reasons for um, post-operative mor morbidity. Um, so the, the inflammatory response created by the bypass circuit and the neurologic damage by various neurologic insults during procedure recognized and unrecognized, and also the timing of the surgery. We are doing this in five-day-old baby, 10-day-old babies, and that may be a very vulnerable period during that time. There are un, uh, certain things that we cannot change. The associated congenital anomalies have contributed to some problems and genetic syndromes that coexist with these situations also um, contribute to this mortality problem. These are not changeable, but we can work on some of these uh, low, the, the items in the lower part of this list. So just a quick uh, recap of hyperplastic left heart syndrome still remains unconquered, I would say. And uh, while counseling parents uh, after a fetal diagnosis, we still offer these three options in that no treatment is still there. And it varies from physician to physician, institution to institution, state to state in, in the US, the, the state laws vary uh, between every state. And then the time at which the diagnosis is made during pregnancy, all of them are um, influencing it. Heart transplant as an option, we will mention it just because it is there, but it has become um, not that much used anymore because of lack of availability of um, donor hearts. So um, um, just also for some of the adult folks who may not know what, um, what the surgery involves in the first stage. So they go through three stage surgery, first stage is as a newborn, second stage is about five months old or so, anytime after three months of age. And then third stage is done around three years of age. So um, this is the first stage surgery. There's a cartoon of hypoplastic left heart syndrome where this left ventricle is very, very small and you have a very hypoplastic ascending iota and then the aortic arch and the rest of the iota usually is good size. So the real issue is the small LB, small mitral valve and the ascending iota. So the um, a task during the newborn period is to construct an iota using the main pulmonary artery that is available. We need still keep, we need to still keep this little stump of uh, ascending iota because aortic root, because the coronaries are coming off of the, that little um, stump. And then the whole aortic arch gets uh, reconstructed with um, a patch material. Usually it is um, homograph material that forms the lower part of this aortic arch. And now that we have taken away the pulmonary blood flow, we have to add some source of uh, pulmonary uh, blood flow. The BT shunt was the traditional procedure, but uh, plate B, we have abandoned um, petition in most centers and RV2PA conduit 
called the Sano shant is being used. So that's our extensive stage one procedure, getting the kids through the immediate post-operative period is a major issue for any institution. In some ways, the outcome for Narwood is a defining uh, number for the institution's quality. So the, the time, these are very good numbers, I have to say. Time on, on the ventilator is seven days. If the patient gets extubated in seven days, we are very happy about a Norwood patient. Um, 14 days in the ICU, also very optimistic. The total, the length of um, hospitalization, these are average numbers. Majority of them go further. If the patient goes home in one month after new, um, Norwood procedure, that's a very good outcome for the patient. And the survival to discharge is 83% in this study. This is that uh, multi-center um, study, randomized study that was comparing BT shunt versus the RV2PA conduit, the SANO shunt uh, and the outcomes. Um, that's the, uh, it's actually a randomized study. So as an alternative, can we avoid um, doing a major surgery as a newborn and achieve these and get these children to grow a little bit drag it out to three to six months of age and do that surgery at that point in time. So what do we need for the babies to survive to three months to six months? And, and the, the requirements are these three requirements from hemodynamic point of view. You have a hypoplastic left heart. So when the pulmonary venous return comes to the left atrium, it doesn't have anywhere to go into the LV. Therefore, there has to be an adequate AST. So that, that's one. Two, um, there has to be adequate systemic blood flow. So these, these patients are resuscitated with the prostaglandin and the prostaglandin keeps that duct open and continue, and continue to supply the systemic blood flow. So we need to keep that systemic blood flow going. And then with time, what happens when the pulmonary vascular resistance drops after birth, the pulmonary circulation gets over flooded. So there's an overflow in the pulmonary circulation. So we need to control that pulmonary blood flow. If not, patient will go into heart failure from too much pulmonary blood flow. And so these are the three requirements for this person, babies to survive into third year, third, third month or third, three to six months of age. So these three items are um, achieved using this hybrid procedure. This came up, this plan came up in various places. People have done it. And then finally in Columbus, Ohio, the group there really took the, took a lead and created this as a routine procedure for them. So Dr. Galantovich is a surgeon who um, published a lot on this one and he's the um, leader in this group. In this yeah. So you do a balloon atrial septostomy, you put a stent in the PDA and put PA bands in the branches. So these three requirements are achieved by doing these three interventions and and these are all done without going on bypass and without subjecting the child to major surgery. So all of these are, the, the PDA stent and the um, atrial septostomy are possible through catheters, but um, you need to open up to do the PA band. As of yet, we don't have any pulmonary flow restrictors that are predictable. We have some, we have some ideas, but um, they are not ready uh, and for a predictable, uh, and therefore it is still surgical PA bands. So this, um, this was introduced and this allows us to postpone the surgery for about three to six months. And then what happens in three to six months, you still have to deal with the whole requirements. So that full surgery, the, the stage one part, the reconstruction of a new iota is still has to be done at that second stage. Second stage becomes a more involved, larger surgery. So it's, this is called comprehensive stage two instead of calling it just stage two where aortic arch construction is performed and um, Glenn operation is done by connecting the SVC to the pulmonary arteries. And that's the procedure. And so the criticism of this was, oh, we are, these guys are going to have um, higher mortality in the stage two a time we just have shifted the mortality from the newborn period to the three to six months old period. But that didn't turn out to be the case in, I have to say it, in Columbus um, experience, Dr. Galantovic's experience. So for, what he had was for hybrid stage one, 
he had two point one death out of 40. So that's 2.5%. And then comprehensive stage two, he had three deaths that comes to about 8.3%. And then stage three is the Fontaine operation. There were no deaths in that period. So it is a, at one year, if you go by between stage two to stage three, it is 82.5% survival, which is actually much better than what we had. So this is the comparison. Um, so this is Nationwide Children's Hospital in, Colum in Columbus, hybrid procedure approach. And these two others are Boston Children's BT shunt and Boston Children's Sano shunt outcomes. And if you see in stage one, the mortality is 2.5%, as we saw in the previous slide. And in the uh, BT shunt group, 11%, and in the Sano shunt group, 15% in the in Boston Children's group. Overall, it's about, this is a good number here. 17% is your usual average. And then if you went to stage two mortality, this is the comprehensive stage two mortality. It's only 8%. And um, the corresponding one from that New England Journal article is 7.5%, which includes children, Boston Children's data in it, it's seven centers in that data. So 7.5%, that is comparable, same, um, mortality as the regular stage two versus this comprehensive stage two. So the um, Columbus people have shown that this is possible. And what they did was they took all comers and subjected them to hybrid procedures. That is very different. And we don't do like that. The centers that have good results with Narwood, they, they, they are having a hard time going into this hybrid procedure mode. So um, it, it hasn't taken up, it has been taken up by others that much, but this is still a good demonstration of how morbidity can be reduced. And uh, so this is the comparison in this, in this um, multi-center study. A one-year survival in this uh, traditional group is 26% versus 36% between the BT Shen group and the uh, RVTPA conduit, that's the San Ocean group. Um, compared to that, the um, survival in the hybrid group is higher at 82.5%. 82, 82. Um, so uh, it's, it's a good number from Columbus, but this is the caveat. It has not been reproduced outside of Columbus, Ohio, Nationwide Children's Hospital, where the group has been doing. And there are multiple theories about why no one else has seen such good results. Um, the, the reason could be that um, others only go for risky patients. High risk patients are subjected to hybrid procedures rather than low risk patients also. So in Columbus, they took low, low risk, medium risk, high risk, everybody is in there. All comers got the hybrid procedure during, their, during those studies. And so um, the jury is out about applicability of this. Um, there are a lot of things about getting the size of the PA bands correct and placing the PDA stent successfully and also avoiding coarctation from the upper end of the reverse coarctation it's called from the upper end of the stent um, partially occluding the flow towards the upper part of the aortic arch. All of those are technical issues and they also have to be well done. Um, there are lots of, when you listen to Dr. Galantovich, it seems like it's just a straightforward thing. Getting the sizes are all very straightforward, but it's been difficult for reproducing this. Um, so whenever you see a picture that's unrelated, that means I'm gonna to switch to a different topic, we'll see. Um, so I thought we'll go to the next uh, example in this uh, group. That's a very, um, organized, planned hybrid procedure. From now on, the cases that I'm going to show are going to be for situations where there is some other risk factor and therefore they are becoming a higher risk person for a transcatheter procedure and therefore you use the surgeon's input and um, come, up, come up with a um, way to decrease the risk for the situation. So I, this is just a um, a uh, standard case of mid-muscular VSD. It's relatively a small VSD here. And um, a Amplatzer muscular VSD um, device has been placed in the cath lab. So it's just to um, orient people about the device. 
and there is a transesophageal echo that's guiding the procedure apart from the angiograms. Um, so when the when the div, when VST is in the mid muscular portion, it's a very easy situation to do the procedure. But when the when the VST goes to the apical location and it is significant, luckily most of the apical muscular VSTs are small, and therefore we don't have to go and close it. May given adequate time, it will close spontaneously or at least decrease in size. But uh, when they are significantly large and we have to close it, then it is a problem for both surgeon as well as the interventionalist. For interventionalists, the um, the delivery sheath doesn't make the turn and smaller the child, higher is the risk. So I've got, oh, so this is the one case. This is our um, pediatric cat lab in uh, Houston. Um, you know what case we are doing? It's just an example for uh, cat lab. So we took an 11 month old, not a small baby. It's, um, I think it was nine kilograms or eight kilogram child. It's a little bit small for 11 months. And, um, and we started off with um, the wire is across, you will see it, and it's going out through the aortic valve. And we are struggling to place the sheath. And I think all of everyone here is a cardiologist already see the problem developing. Um, pericardial effusion starting to develop. And there is, when we evaluated um, the the cat was a sheath had perforated the LVFX. And the, the catheter, the sheath wouldn't make the turn to, for it to be placed securely for the device advancement. So we, at this point, we, have, we took a pericardiocentesis, gave the blood out, it came out very fast. So we kept transfusing, auto transfusing the patient. And then ultimately we had to open the chest in the cat lab and uh, take care of that epical. And that was a very unplanned intervention there. So these types of situations keep coming up in our procedures. So um, we, we um, had to think twice before attempting anything like this, or, or even uh, in patients get um, non-cardiac morbidities, a baby in the neonatal unit, um, let's say 3.5 kilogram baby, it comes up with a significant BST that needs to be closed, but there are pulmonary comorbidities or other comorbidities that will make them high risk cases for cardiac surgical procedure, and we can apply it in this situation. So the apical perforation happened in that patient. Even for the surgeon, it's not a straightforward procedure because even it is in the apex and the right atrial approach, it is far away and you have um, trabeculations in the way that are hiding the view and you cannot reach to put sutures. So some surgeons do LV um, apical uh, ventriculotomy and approach it, but it becomes quite a size in a newborn to do that. So um, hybrid procedure has become the way to approach such a case. So this is one such case um, in the operating room. So one of the things about where should a hybrid procedure be performed? Do we always need a hybrid suite, hybrid cat lab that is specially designed for this? Season? That's not the case. All you need is a good idea and figure out in that patient what kind of imaging is needed and where are we going to get it? Um, either in the cat lab, is it going to be fluoroscopy or can it be done with TEE or an epicardial echo? Or in one case, we actually used a thoracoscopic view, um, thoracoscope through, the, it was going to be a mitral valve repair and BST closure in that patient. The surgeon actually put a thoracoscope through the mitral valve after opening the LA, through the mitral valve, we were able to watch the device being deployed from, through that thoracoscope in the LV. So how we do it, where we do it is really up to the surgeon and the intervention risk and the facilities available in the institution. So this is Houston, and this is um, Dr. Brian Holt, my colleague in Houston, and the surgeon here, and a TEE person here, Dr. Srinivasan is here. And uh, the location of the access is key to crossing the VST. 
it will look like uh, it's an easy procedure, easy, easy step to cross the VST in a cat lab, but it is very hard in the operating room to cross it. TEE doesn't help very much if, in, except to confirm that you're crossing it when you cross it. So um, the, the simplest method that really works is um, the surgeon should feel for a thrill and that will be the VST jet. There are situations where no, no thrill can be felt. That's another problem. Then we have to make an educated guess where to put the access in. So on the RV free wall, you look for the thrill and choose that spot. And then the uh, bursting suture is placed and a um, access needle is placed and then wire. And then the, over the wire, the sheet, sheet is sheet will be placed. And uh, I had a picture, it's not there in this um, situation. The sheet is in position here. That's the wire. And then the sheet is in position and the device is gonna be coming up and it is deployed. Um, so here is the device deployed and that's the end of the procedure. This is um, done with sternotomy, but no bypass required. Um, that's the lack of needing the bypass in a person with uh, comorbidities that just saves the time. And these are other publications that Emil Basha's group has done this procedure and the pictures are very nice. Where the guide wire is going through the VST and then a sheet is in there and then the full device is deployed. And there, so there is no limit to how this can be done. Um, this um, I can see because especially when the, when the heart is not beating, if it is stopped and it is cardioplegia has been applied, it becomes a more difficult procedure than when the heart is beating. That's a very important lesson. We've done um, two cases with the heart stopped and that was, they, they, they have been the toughest cases to do. And I can see from this publication from, um, don't know where it is from, um, the, this publication, they have a difficulty. This, for getting the um, sheath through the VST and getting it out there is, the, is a real problem. So they have put a right angled clamp and then pulled it around. Um, sometimes in a small baby, it's, this is not possible. This picture makes it look like it's a straightforward thing to do, but it's not possible. So the, the kids we got into trouble with, we ended up using the PDA delivery sheath and the 180 degree turn helps and we actually just got it all the way out, out, out through the mitral valve. It is, it is actually outside the chest for some time. And then we then put the device on and pulled it backwards in with very carefully guiding it through the mitral valve and then deployed it. So the, the best way to deploy these, do these um, uh, VST devices is to place it before going on bypass. If the patient is going on bypass for additional surgery inside the heart, and this VST is remote for the surgeon, therefore we want it done with the device. So we should do it before going on bypass, place the device, and then the surgeon goes on uh, bypass and does this. That's um, just from our experience, that's what I think should be done. So that's about the amplats of devices. So the same, same uh, uh, Bullfinch building is what we call this building and there's that uh, ether dome um, where the demonstration happened. This was a picture from December. So you can't sit there, it's all filled with snow. Uh, let's go to another um, procedure. Pulmonary atresia with intact ventricular septum. Traditionally, a BT shunt or a RVTP conduit or a transcellular patch repair will be done. Um, and the transcatheter approach has, becoming, uh, has become more common to do this. And um, there is a special radio frequency wire nowadays available commercially to perforate the valve that makes life much, much easier than what we used to do in the past. And then serial balloon dilatation of the valve actually gives us what we want to, want to have. Be and this, the case has to be carefully chosen. The, the size of the RV should be um, meeting some of the requirements so that uh, the patient will not require any more or has the potential to grow. And uh, it has to be a um, membranous type of uh, pulmonary atresia and the RV outflow tract should be in a need that should be formed. So this is a case that done in the cat lab, not a hybrid, the hybrid comes later. So right um, lateral view of the right ventricular angiogram, 
and you can see the RV outflow track and there is a plate like uh, pulmonary valve without an opening in it. And I, um, usually in a newborn baby, a JR4 catheter has the correct curve that will reach the pulmonary valve and face the correct plane. That's very, very important. It's very easy for this catheter tip to look upwards. And if it looks upward, it is actually against the front wall of the RV. That's a very important point. And about seven to 10% of cases is what is reported in the literature, have RV outflow tract perforation with this procedure. So that's not as trivial incidence to have. So that's the, um, the key point is where the, the, the tip of the catheter is facing. It should be facing the valve, not the top, top portion, the in front of the valve. And so this is a uh, straightforward uh, outcome. So the Bayless um, RF wire has just passed through. So you use about two to five watts of power and it makes the perforation. The wire advances and then you advance the, this bailiff RF wire comes with a little tiny sheath on it so that sheet slides on that wire, even though that wire is very weak. And then over that, you can exchange it to a thicker wire and then um, sheath and then the, um, serial balloon dilatation. Sometimes the sheath won't make it. You may have to use a coronary balloon and take them, enlarge the hole and then you use serially larger sizes. And if you get up to the eight millimeter size balloon, it will be a good result. And this is one of the later balloons, I think. Occasionally, um, often you just need only two balloons, not many. A small one and then a two target size. And this is the um, picture afterwards. You can see that the uh, during systole, this RV outflow tract is very hypertrophied and it is very, very small. That is a dynamic obstruction. So this is a still frame of that angiogram. The valve is actually the broader portion here that has been opened, but you have subvalvar stenosis. This is something we'll, have, we'll end up dealing with until this RVH resolves, this patient is not getting an adequate opening there. And so RV is very non-compliant and you have pulmonary ovale that will be open and that will be shunting right to left and the patient will be cyanotic. So post um, procedure, even after a successful procedure, there will be cyanosis that we will have to deal with. If we can carry it over for four weeks or six weeks, this RVH resolves enough to um, allow the patient to go home. So that's the um, patient's point. So um, inpatient physicians will our patient is very sick, very um, cyanotic. We can't manage. Um, we will have to put a BT stent on top of this or put a stent in the PDA. One of the two options will have to be done in the post cath period for these patients. So this is the location where we get into trouble. So if you see where this catheter is looking, I have a feeling this is not JR4 catheter. See the tip is not curved. This looks like a a multi-purpose catheter or a um, sorry okay so um, and it is facing the front wall of the RV not the pulmonary valve posteriorly and um, a check angiogram not good so you have it looks like a contained contained uh, perforation or intramyocardial injection, it's, but it's a baby. So that ultimately becomes this five minutes later. You tell there is a perforation, but it is staying stable. So we stopped the case and then went to the operating room next morning. And uh, as the sternotomy was performed, and in the RV outflow track, RV body location, I put a first string and through the first string, introduce a needle. If you get access to the RV, and here is your pulmonary valve area. And using fluoroscopy, just a regular portable CM fluoroscopy in the operating room, and TEE for, um, guidance, we just did this procedure. We didn't have any special hybrid lab at that time. Um, so um, here is the CM is helping to just make sure that the wire went through the 
PDA and then went into the descending aorta. So that's after that confirmation, we're putting the catheter, um, balloon catheter across. The uh, needle actually can, when we get the access, the needle actually we saw the pulmonary valve in the TEE and just we advanced the needle through the pulmonary valve into the main pulmonary artery. And when we put the wire, it just went straight into the TEE. And here is the guide wire. And um, this is the ballooning. There's the guide wire, balloon is in location and the balloon is uh, inflated there. Here also, we did a smaller balloon and this is the second of the two. And so we, these are still images just in case the other ones didn't work. So um, that was a good outcome. That patient uh, stayed in the hospital for about four weeks and went home. And we discharged the patient on oxygen, very small amount of oxygen. And it took four, four months or so for that REH to dissolve and the PA portion to decrease and the patient not holding up the saturations. So uh, how low a saturation do we accept is another situation. Um, so to buy some time, even after the procedure is done because of the infundibular stenosis causing this dynamic RV outflow tract obstruction, prostaglandin may be used oxygen propranolol uh, in various combinations will help. So those are the three, case, three um, categories, but this has been done for various other situations. Um, our imagination and willingness is the limit for this kind of procedure. And the uh, ability of the surgeons and the interventionists working together and coming up with a way to doing that is the key to this. You don't need a cath lab, special cath lab for this, but you need the mindset for it. That's the key. The hybrid procedures happen in the minds of people who do it rather than in the cath labs or in the operating rooms or the hybrid rooms. And we have done several cases um, off late, uh, off late meaning before I left Houston, intraoperative pulmonary artery banding, intraoperative aortic arch banding we have done in certain cases for various reasons. The surgeon, it's a re-op and they don't want to go digging around and this sealed inside and there is tough tissue. And so they will call in the middle of the case even without any prior planning. And one of us will just take our stuff and go there and do the procedure. And then PDS stenting, and we have done a couple of PDS stents with that were very difficult to access from the groin or anywhere else, um, just opened and we put the PDS stent in there. Um, so that's the, uh, we got another picture means the subject is gonna change. Um, this is my journey, 1986, I graduated from, um, so 1981 to 86 was the time. Plus first, plus two batch, we were, and then um, Stanley Medical College. And then in 2020, I have ended up in this medical school. So there is another opportunity. This is the bronchial stent. So after joining my Mass General Hospital, they, their ENT department is a separate hospital, famous one. They get lots of complex patients. And this patient ended up coming and there is a physician, who, a surgeon who is really specializing in airway issues, tracheal stenosis and bronchial stenosis. Therefore, we have collaborated with him. And this patient is an eight-year-old girl with single kidney originally had renal transplant and um, had many uh, problems because of many admissions because of respiratory distress and problems when we evaluated it. She has unilateral lung expansion in the chest X-ray and the left side will be collapsed. And it will also look like um, um, it is hypoplastic over time. So there is a chest CT I will show. So chest CT shows it had to be done without contrast. So um, because of her renal problem, renal, um, chronic renal failure after the transplant. So transplant kidney was, transplanted kidney was failing. Um, so left main bronchus is completely collapsed. It is compressed by descending aorta in the back and in the front, it is RPA. So main pulmonary artery is coming on the side and then RPA and uh, um, descending aorta were compressing it. You can see that here. And the reason for that is the descending aorta, which should be on the left side of the spine in this location has moved over uh, to this midline. And then the 
main pulmonary artery is coming here, bifurcation is somewhere in this location, and then the right PA is coming in front on top of it in a different plane, and left pulmonary artery is here. So the, um, interestingly, the, and the uh, tracheal, um, trachea is on the right side and bifurcation is somewhere here. This is the left main bronchus, which is actually curving around this descending aorta. And it is compressed by RPA and descending aorta. So we got together. This is actually, it's a big team. Uh, there's a general surgeon who was helping us out. There is a ENT surgeon who is holding on to this um, um, uh, the, uh, scope. We have a C arm. This is all make makeshift arrangements here. Um, and I am standing somewhere. Number three is me. And this is David Lawler. And this is the company rep, nurse here. And anesthesiologists are in the back. We used this group and um, stented this because of various reasons. So the so here is the analysis that we did preoperatively. Uh, very nice pictures from the cardiac surgical team in Boston Children's Hospital. We are one, one unit at this point. So they helped me out by getting this thing. So here is the compression happening between the RPA or bifurcation and the descending aorta in the back and the um, bronchus is curving around the descending aorta. So we created a 3D printed model, life-size model of this. If the patient were standing, you have this trachea here, left main bronchus, RPA in the front, descending aorta in the back. And we, we just actually took one of the stents, covered stents and deployed it pre-procedure pre just to see where it will uh, settle down with the two vessels in the front and the back. Um, and we got this size, six millimeter to nine millimeter. When you straighten it out, it's gonna change. It was curving around the descending aorta. So, um, what we found was this st this stent that we have deployed is too short, 15 millimeters. So we picked 19 millimeter stent, and um, that's the medial interest of time. So this is the final outcome of this covered stent. The two vessels being on either side, bare metal stent. We were worried if it will dig into the vascular tissue, and therefore the covered stent is a insurance against it. The problem may be theoretically. The, this area, stented area, is not going to have ciliary function. Um, so she's on a regular hypertonic saline nebulizer twice a day and ciprodex on a periodic basis um, just to avoid colonization. This is only to uh, find, uh, buy some time until she is ready for dialysis and ready for next transplant. So we have got her six months or nine months uh, now and she will go on with it. So what the stenting bronchus has been going on for a long time in adult world, they are using it for malignancies and various compressions from uh, in, intrinsic as well as extrinsic compressions. The silicone stents have been used for a long time, but they are not suitable for kids. We are, this is a eight year old girl that we did, but most of her prior experiences in infants. Um, and by the way, the uh, surgical repair for that patient would have been posterior iota pexy, move the iota back to the uh, location so that it doesn't compress. But that will be a very involved procedure, will need by bypass and long procedure. There. That's the hesitation from the cardiac surgical team. And therefore, they asked the ENT team and then ENTS. And they knew that I had just joined. So this happened that way. The cardiac surgeons actually asked if I could do the procedure. That's how we. This ended up being so. This VB extent is what we used, and it is it has multiple good good qualities. Flexible, open cell, therefore it is flexible. It has enough strength to keep the iota and the uh, pulmonary artery away. And we have used bare metal stents in the past, for, especially for small kids. And this is our current um, hybrid cat lab in Houston. We built it in the past two years, so I have been very much involved in designing and uh, executing this, this uh, cat lab construction. Um, large room and it has uh, multiple outlets, multiple monitors for anesthesiologist, surgeon and the catheterizer, biplane cat lab on that side. And there is space for cardiopulmonary bypass machine to be parked 
um, and it will have hot water, cold water, all those two cups on that side. And the TEE can be placed in one position here. So that's the, um, probably that's the conclusion of uh, the um, hybrid part of the procedure. And this is Dr. Salazar, that's me. So once you get to work together, as I said before, imagination is the limit. And um, I think I've taken a lot of time. There are only 10 more minutes. I will just quickly run through this one case of um, Amplatso Piccolo device. This was approved in February of 2019, approved for anyone more than four, 700 grams. And um, they should be more than three days of age. Now, if it is more than four millimeters, this is not the ideal device. The diameter of the PDA should be four millimeters or less. And the length of the um, PDA should be more than four, three millimeters. And pre-existing coarctation LPS stenosis should not be present. And the other standard things. So we have had other devices that are in the bottom. Um, we have used muscular VSC devices in these locations. AVP2 has been used in these small kits. The standard amplats duct occluder has been used in the past. And then we have this amplats duct occluder 2. And that 2 has been modified. And that's now called, in these sizes, it's called Piccolo nowadays. And that's, that's the advertising picture from the company. They just want to enhance to show that, that how small it is. Um, so the, the, um, as far as the procedure is concerned, less than two kilos venous access only, two to three kilos, mostly venous access only. If they are more than three kilos, I sometimes put the arterial access and use the conventional techniques. So below three kilograms, it's generally venous access only um, because artery is too small to take any sheep at all. Um, and the then you have no uh, ability to do iotogram as a checking check angiogram. That's where the issue comes and you use um, transthoracic echo to do that part. Um, so here are the um, outcomes of this um, national level multi-centered study where um, 100 kids below 200, two, two kilograms were performed and they have a bimodal um, weight distribution. So one set of uh, the peak comes from around that one kilogram mark and then another peak comes around this 1.5 to 1.7 kilogram mark. If you think about what gestational age these kids are, they are usually 24 to 28 um, weeks gestation at birth. And then they have, um, they are usually done around three weeks or four weeks of age. This, this would have allowed some time for the medical management, the pharmacology therapy to be given and then made a decision about whether it worked or not worked, and then you go. Um, and that also, this is the new wisdom that three weeks plus, three to four weeks, three to five weeks is the ideal time based on how long it takes for them to recover from the procedure, how much problems we see during the procedure and after the procedure. Later we do the, do the procedure, seems like they are suffering or not suffering. They've already got chronic lung disease set in phase and pulmonary hypertension with it. And therefore, after closing this PDA, we are dealing with the consequences of those pulmonary hypertension and chronic lung disease. And therefore we are not making a big time change in their clinical management if we are doing it very late. So I initially, I did them at six weeks, seven weeks, when they were a little bit closer to two kilograms or 2.5 kilograms, because we are still learning and getting our own act together about doing cardiac cath procedures for smaller and smaller kids. So we also have to grow our experience into that thing. So, um, so this is again from Dr. Sadanandam, Shyam Sadanandam is from Chennai actually. He's in Memphis, Tennessee, and he has been the pioneer in getting this Piccolo device at approved actually. So he is he's, he's very uh, active and he has a yearly PDA symposium that he conducts in Memphis. Very, very, very good symposium. So they have, that group in Memphis have come up with uh, 
additional type of PDA. The, the PDAs in preemie babies are similar, having the same appearance as a fetal echo PDA appearance, and they call it the F type. So A to E is a well-known uh, classification, morphology classification in the cath labs, and that now the F has been added, F for fetal type. And it has that hockey, inverted hockey shape appearance, hockey stick appearance. And the difference between the standard PDA closure and the preemie PDA closure is that the um, device has to be placed completely introductory. No retention disc on the aortic side, no retention disc on the PA side, it has to be completely inside the duct. That's your, and the radial force of this device is what is gonna hold it. And so that's a, um, that's an important difference. And if it is a little bit towards the pulmonary artery, a little bit towards the aorta, it has to be adjusted. So I'll, I'll show this one, one case and then I will stop. 1.6 kilogram baby, so PA view. PA view is not very helpful. And um, lateral view, I'll show this, um, the um, free frozen frame of this picture. So here is a frozen frame. Very important is the NG tube in this patient. NG tube um, marks the iota. So the aortic end, in the, in the angiogram, we can have a mental picture of how far, where is the aortic end of the PDA in relationship to the NG tube. So we put an NG tube routinely in all cases to mark the iota. And um, here is the PDA and the PDA's aortic end is right there. So we have a narrower, so this is that F, F type, narrower PA end and a wider body and the ampulla of the PDA is here. And then there is a device, I think it's 4-2 device was chosen. And this looks more closer to the aortic end. This is a check angiogram. So this was released after it was pulled back a little more. So if you use the NG tube as a reference previously that tip of that retention disc was on this um, NG tube. So now we pulled it in for, forward and that's this is now more introductory. If you go back to the previous picture, there is more duct in this location and therefore we pulled it back in. So each case is a little bit different and we just have to, that is, so this is a very good position. And then at the end of the, and everything is taken, we don't take any more picture. Even that angiogram is a superfluous one. It's all assessed by transesophageal echo. And then at the end of the procedure, we go to PA view and lateral view and take a picture so that we can compare it with the chest X-ray in the NICU as a follow-up. So these are the in, intra-procedural evaluations. The key point is you want to, before releasing the device, so you, deploy the device, hold on to it with the delivery cable and let the echo guys come in and do the echocardiogram to show us the arch side and LPA side. As long as we can get one plane in the echo without the device showing in the lumen, we are good. Like this one, that one. And uh, here is another. So LPA, you see the disc, but it is uh, not obstructing the LPA flow. And then this is the other. The aortic side. So we tell the technician, show me the aorta without the device. If they are able to show that, that's a good position. That's one of the, so here we don't see the device at all, that if we can show that it's a good position. Same way with the aortic, uh, LPA side. So um, we had a case where the device could not be placed. We took it out. And the next day, it became very small. This is the next day. And five days later, it completely closed. And it happened in three different cases. And these are cases where we have attempted to place the device. And for some reason or other, we took out the device. So there was this mechanical stimulation may be inducing PDA closure, spontaneous PDA closure. So that's something to explore. We presented this in last year's fix. We'll, it'll come out as a paper soon. Um, I think this is something ex worth exploring. Um, just instrumentation of the PDA, not leaving any device, maybe one technique that we can use in the future. So I'm going to stop there and um, take any questions or it's already took almost all the time. Go ahead. Thank you.
thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Palaguru. It was really enlightening on very complex procedures that are done in the smallest of the patients. And that makes it um, much more difficult and we need to be very, very precise. And especially those PDA pictures showed us how precise it had to be. Um, it was also interesting to note that uh, many times the surgeons are uncomfortable to be in the cath lab to do this hybrid procedures. So as you said, uh, this is the first time I'm just realizing that many times we may not need a cath um, or the fluoroscopy, maybe just a transesophageal echo would itself be adequate. So the whole procedure could be done in the theater with transesophageal uh, echo, like a VST closure and things like that. Additionally, fluoroscopy, just a portable yeah. fluoroscopy. Yeah, and a portable fluoroscopy with the C-arm. This is just, um, these are some pictures yeah. from the hybrid lab. Table controls are now different and anesthesiologists are a little bit lost when the surgeon asks for head down tilt or right tilt, left tilt in the OR. Um, this, this table is capable of doing it, but it has to be controlled from these buttons that are actually in the wrong spot for the anesthesiologist. This is in the put end. They want it under. And then, they, so in all of these cases, one cat lab technician will stay until the end of the case. We will have no role after some, I hope they may continue with another surgical part of the procedure. So there are some practical issues. Every case you need to think about who the personnel are in the room and how it, who's going to operate what part. And then this is the crowded uh, left side of the patient where the patient, uh, the cardiopulmonary bypass machine is. And you have the biplane room, the lateral camera pushed away, and there is still the TEE is still there. So we're able to accommodate everything, but it is very, very crowded. Okay. Yeah. We have a uh, question there is, from uh, you know, there are one or two questions. Okay. Yeah, sure. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, carry on, Aramya. Okay. Yeah, Sir, uh, I'm trying there's to a see question from carry on, carry on. Yeah. Aramya, carry on, please. There's a question from the audience, sir. Uh, what they've asked, like, what is the indication in the preterm PDA closure? Does the, all the preterms with the PDA need closure? Oh, good question. That's the biggest controversy um, in in the U.S. So, um, I'm an interventional cardiologist who can close PDAs. So, what do you expect from me? <laughs> so, <laughs> So um, no, no. I think uh, we have to have some equipoise. Um, I think there are the, the neonatologists, we are led by the neonatologists in, in the institution. So the institutional opinion about um, whether the PDA needs closing, closing at all is a big question. Um, our institution has swung back and forth. Um, so I think half of the neonatologists have the opinion that PDA does not need to be closed at all. And then half think that it is important to close. So it depends on which, which type of neonatologists that are in the institution they are going to direct us. So with this controversy, it was too much for us to, um, as cardiologists, to come and solve the problem or the um, issue for them and therefore in our division, what we decided in our institution, we said, okay, you're not gonna come and tell you when to close. You tell us if you need it closed, then I will tell you if I can do it. <laughs> so that's, that's the way we turned the plate over. That's mm -hmm. not, really not a good answer, but there are data accumulating now. Uh, there is one paper, uh, I didn't include it, it is in some other slide set, where the duration of exposure to PDA then the PDA is another, we have to qualify the PDA, hemodynamically significant PDA, HSPDA, that's what the lowercase h, lowercase s, PDA. That's hemodynamically significant PDA. They have to be more than two millimeters at least, diameter wise. 
and uh, there should be associated LALB enlargement. That's one of the requirements that has to be fulfilled and we shouldn't be doing it without those, those things, these minimum qualifications. So when it is a hemodynamically significant PDA, there are um, the duration for which the PDA has been observed and the incidence of lung bronchitis disease involvement, the respiratory score, respiratory severity score, or the, those are worse if the PDA has been let to grow longer. That's all, that's, that's one of the studies, but every study has its weakness. And therefore the group that doesn't want the PDAs closed will have something that's the problem with each study. So at the moment, that's where we are. There are one or two studies that really clearly show the BPD incidence is not different between the group that had the PDA closure and the group that did have the PDA. So the PDA closure group and the non-closure group didn't differ in the PP, BPD incidence. That's one of the big papers. If you look into it, it seems like a very properly done paper. So we can't fault the methodology in it and it has this. So that's one of the papers that's being quoted by um, unitologists who don't want to close the PDA. So yeah, I, I don't have an answer for that. <laughs> Just because this is still a controversy and we are very gently working through it. I've changed institution now. Here, it is a mixture. It seems like half within the division itself, there are people who don't think PDA needs to be closed and then other group. Them. So you're doing a small number of PDA closures. Many of times so it is the neonatologist thinks like once we close the PDA, we, we can uh, extubate the child immediately, but that's, that doesn't happen often, no, sir? Yeah, so yeah, that's the... Um, that's what I meant about the timing of the procedure. So yeah, you have uh, your own lung issue, lung immaturity problem on the background. So that's gonna require, and the baby's own weight. Baby is 700 gram, 800 gram baby. It's not gonna get estimated. It doesn't have the muscle mass to breathe. That's, uh, so there, it's multifactorial. Therefore, extubation need not be the focus of this. Um, it, it's the, uh, in, NEC incidents and all that are also into it. It's all a complex um, group of problems, morbidities and then IVH incidents. Those are all also in, um, put in there. The data has been very difficult to come by. Um, so that's one side of it. So there is this, um, when we do this three weeks to maybe up to six weeks or five weeks, three to five weeks, three to six weeks time period, it seems like it gives the best possible outcome because by then the highly membrane disease has settled and they are in this window of BPD setting in, qualifying for the definition of BPD. In that period, when we do it, and the damage caused by the increased permeable blood flow is not as much, and therefore we, are, we get the best outcome. That's what we think as interventional cardiologists. And then the ones that um, struggle and not extubate are the ones that are very old. They are eight weeks old, three months old. Their weight is 2.8 kilos but they are old and they have had already BPD and pulmonary hypertension. In that context, we are doing something and they don't seem to get better anytime soon. So doing it very late also, uh, this is discouraging to see the post-procedure post outcome. I've had some, and then also there is another issue about, is there a post-ligation syndrome after PDA closure? Um, that's another big controversy, whether it exists or not. It seems like it exists. I've seen some, there is a slight deterioration. It's not as bad as some of the surgical thoracotomy PDA ligation patients who go into a full-blown full um, LV dysfunction, RV dysfunction kind of biventricular dysfunction with the edema and that and three days of severe support and then they get better. And that that is not... It's not that bad, but they see a, we see a little bit of LV dysfunction the day after the PDA closure in that echo. We sub, sometimes have used milrinone for these kids after, after closing. Calcium chloride seems to help as an inotrope. Um, those are the, and steroids have been used in some papers. So that's the post ligation. So those are all the post procedural PDA uh, closure um, follow-up is also a little bit of complicated uh, period. Yeah, they may not get excavated immediately. 
sir i have one more question so you were quoting about the uh, three children who who are attempted a pda device closure and later you found that the pdas were spontaneously closed what was the time interval between the intervention and the pda closure sir when we observe oh so that one i showed was 5 days later right 5 days later so okay. i showed uh, the one uh, that one was 5 days no the others are next day next day there was one kid in 24 hours another kid in 48 hours possibly so, the catheter induced vasospasm could be explained in that uh, condition sir or yeah. uh, but um, yeah all of yeah so it's not just vasospasm that it is going to reopen after few days that we haven't seen in these three kids this is now 5 months from all of them all three okay. of them and um, none of them have reopened okay sir so okay. so yeah i think it may be real but we don't know it's it's only three patients and it's not like a group followed and studied or anything but it's uh, i've heard about these um, and also we after this when we were preparing the manuscript we found here and there there are reports in the national pivotal study where piccolo device was trialed in us there was one case they only did 50 cases for the approval part uh, one case that they embolized or they couldn't close it so they came to the cath lab they came out back to the floor and decided to come back out to the cath lab next morning to close it next morning they brought the patient back there was no pda so this has happened in other places and sadanandam who has done a lot of cases he recalls maybe six seven cases that he may have seen he has done about 250 cases or so in this um, premi pda so he thinks he has seen those also so it is it is something to think about and all your accesses are ultrasound guided sir for these patients yeah i use uh, ultrasound for even for bigger kids anyone okay. everyone in the cath lab gets sonocyte access so this is no exception uh like malur i have one small question if you do not have a hybrid cath lab where you could do surgery and cath together um have you done or other reports of say like for hypoplastic left heart the stage 1 procedure you do the cath procedure send the baby transfer done, to the right, right, theater right. to do a mm. branch pa um yes banding yes yes how um, long we have actually done it hmm? how long could the interval be because once you open up yeah. the septum i have seen babies just deteriorating quite fast because the pulmonary hypertension which was there has been removed now because of the restrictive pfo has been opened up yeah. and they go into systemic yeah. hypoperfusion yeah we don't have to do all of them in one go um actually we have done cases where for various reasons uh, not as a protocol just for various reasons one case like this one case another another way we have put ba band and continue on prostaglandin about 5 days later we take into the cath lab and put the pda scan and the um, atrial septostomy was never done because their our plan was not to go for all the time he he had something some other comorbidity um <clears throat> suspicion of brain impact something like that was happening therefore we didn't want to do heart surgery and so we just wanted some time probably 3 weeks or 4 weeks we wanted to wait and the patient actually went and had norwood procedure after that so this was giving us some time to um, for the rest of the problems to settle that's how it, so it, it there is no um, fixed limb, fixed um, time we have to go you can do it in steps and it is a Trust me, for that baby was never done because it was just about adequate. Uh, Dr. Balagur, nice presentation. I have one question: those ductus which got closed by the manipulation, what was the diameter of those ductus? Oh, a three, four. Okay. There was a four point two one of them, and then three millimeters. Um, the other one uh, probably a little bit less. close to 3 2.9 so they yeah, are on they, 3 and 4 yeah where well, they happened to may not maybe we never looked it at serious it happened to us 
particularly most of these patients were like um, like we did a murmurectomy like situation we are debating when to close it uh yeah why a regular why a teflon why it goes in and come out we could not put the thing uh, particularly we have had i have had cases where we were not using pda devices rather coil mm. so in those days coil. we have had two instances where mm. we are trying to put a coil the coil was not sitting properly we had uh, appreciation whether it may embolize so we came out beautifully it got mm. closed in few days we were thinking okay it i have rubbed against the doctor's wall caused the endothelial injury mm-hmm. trauma settling and the international card is very famous to close even big vessels with left main even yeah. like on arteries so we yeah. thought it is our job only <laughs> mm, yeah yeah i i agree i i think i have heard this right from my training time people talking about pda closing after a catheter was passed through and taken back one more question it may be out of this topic you were uh, insight about uh, device closure of sinus venous of asd with papvcr papvd where is where, what, what is the current uh, concept or understanding sir yeah i i have never done a case um, just never happened to come across a case to try it out it seems like we have to carefully choose them preoperatively um mri and then in the intra procedure at the beginning of the procedure you do a test balloon occlusion and making sure that the pathway for the um, pulmonary venous return is um, not affected when we deploy the stent itself so yeah that's that and then the third part of that is stability of that stent that has been a problem um so this is all from just reading others and seeing other people's cases not from personal experience but yeah some day a case may come or two and just somehow it has never come my way so far um actually dr um shivakumar in um, tripura i think he has done quite a few cases he did a live case for one of the conferences yeah i think those are all the issues um pre op ct scan or mri and then testing it out with a test balloon occlusion and then the uh, stability of the whatever device we place so we have to choose them carefully the length of it time it is hello i am dr vinod speaking from coimbatore i am a pediatric cardiologist thank you for the excellent talk sir uh just had a doubt regarding this um, regarding some of the babies uh, preterm pdas um some of the, uh, we don't have a problem like convincing uh, like patients who are not able to be extubated from ventilator due to hemodynamic significant pda but some of these mm-hmm. babies have maybe a little oxygen dependency or uh, failure to gain weight or too much of weight gain so mm-hmm. some of these pdas i've noticed that we have tried to counsel the parents for pda device closure and then they refuse and, and they refuse and sometimes they go home on home oxygen and then mm. they come back after 3 to 4 months and then we find that the pda is closed and they're doing well so oh, okay. it brings back to the point like you know the previous studies you've told that uh, is pda device closure really useful i'm sure regarding the yeah. ventilated babies this uh, i mean we can close definitely nobody disagrees with that but these kind of uh, babies like uh, when we can't convince the parents some of them actually have done well actually so that But is yeah, uh, one i agree yeah, i, I and, agree uh, that's where yeah go ahead and the second point is uh, there's one thing you uh, regarding a, a vsd device closure on cardiopulmonary bypass uh, mm. one of the papers so i uh, what was the indication for that like going on cbb and doing vsd device closure because usually oh, the child do... had a severe mr mitral regurgitation from a cleft mitral valve that was a partial av canal with additional vst down in the muscular area okay that was that patient and the muscular vst was also significant size so we we needed to have mitral valve repaired that's that's one part of that's the one on bypass okay and was it maybe difficult for the surgeon to reach the vst that's why that's yeah okay. yeah it's thank apical yeah. oh thank you very much uh, yeah 
Yeah. And we, uh, Bhupati, Dr. Shivakumar would like to talk. He is uh, he's in the meeting. Can you enable him to talk? Bhupati, are we not? Uh, I think Pritam can do it, sir. Pritam, is it possible to do it? Sir, uh, just need to unmute. That's all. Yes, sir. Shivakumar, the floor Bala. is yours. Bala, can you hear uh, me? Hello, hi, Shivakumar. <laughs> Bala, wonderful talk. Enjoyed. I, 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 I think your, your move from Houston back to Boston probably will, would have made you much more adventurous interventionist, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, we're slowly you know, establishing a program. Yeah, 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 yeah very Boston great move. And, and and thoroughly mm -hmm. enjoyed your talk with all your experience, especially the bronchial stint. And it was, it was amazing. It's, it, was a, it was a very thought-provoking, wonderful uh, talk that I heard. Thanks a lot, Bala. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Just, uh, just as you a can joking, comment about uh, that uh, sinus venosis. Yes, yeah. yeah, yeah. One, one, <laughs> one joke. Uh, some of the preterm babies may need to be frightened with a catheter once, uh, uh, even if, uh, if suppose if it is not closing to medications, you, you, you go and hit them with a stick, and then they probably will close. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I just to uh, like the, the real hybrid uh, two interventions that uh, need uh, an, uh, a really close coordination between the surgeon and uh, the interventionist is uh, typically a hyperplastic left heart syndrome intervention, which uh, needs to be completely in synchrony with between the two teams, especially if you are choosing the Columbus approach where uh, you are going to be deploying the ductal stint through the main pulmonary artery. Probably it is not important for a Giesen approach where the surgeon opens, does the pulmonary artery banding, continues on prostin, and then the next day you go ahead into the cath lab and do a transcatheter uh, ductal stenting where the situation is, 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 not, is, is totally different. But the Columbus way of uh, sternotomy, pulmonary artery band, followed by ductal stenting, and then a femoral venous puncture, and doing a balloon atrial septostomy, this needs a thorough, complete coordination between the surgeon and the interventionist. And same way, a hybrid VSD closure, which is which is almost always done in the surgical theater itself under transesophageal echocardiogram, the place where the surgeon punctures initially and gives the mm. uh, guide wire to you, and then subsequently the interventionist starts. I think these are two areas where really I have found a, a complete synchrony between the minds of the interventionist and the surgeon is key to the success of the procedure. I agree, hundred percent. Yeah, they're, they're very important comments. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, there are times when uh, people have struggled after getting the access in the wrong spot and cannot cross the VSD. Um, yeah. Nice start, uh, Bala. I just wanted to say hi to you, and so I I I unmuted myself and barged into your meeting. Thanks a lot. <laughs> it's great to hear hear your voice, and um, it's been a long time since you spoke. Yeah, yeah. like it, it's almost twenty one years now. <laughs> so nice to nice to talk to you again. Okay. Nice to talk to you. Uh, I have one more question. Sure again. Uh, mm, sorry, it's Doctor Vinod. Uh, I'm just asking regarding the VSD hybrid uh, closure. Most of these will be infants with large VSDs. In the uh, suppose we don't have a transesophageal echo for the neonate, is it possible to do with the epicardial echo? I'm just wondering because the space will be very small, you know, for the probe and everything. Yeah, it's difficult, I think, um, because yeah, we, you you've got the access already. It's a small baby, small opening in the sternum, and um, there is just space for you to work, and then you don't have a another spot where you can put the yeah we have not done it so i think it will be difficult to do okay sir the, the epicardial echo um it also depends on the surgeon skills because surgeons are the ones who do it um it needs a little bit of experience and then um, we have used them mostly in um, pulmonary artery stenting situations and other situations but not in a vsd closure it's always been t well, maybe if you, if you find a 12 probe as a small space next to the access location and because you want to see it as you operate, as you advance the wire, as you advance the device. It's not like um, 
you can stop and then look and then do something and then stop so you can't tandem do it in tandem you have to do it simultaneously and therefore it will be hard but it's you have to see it maybe it is possible 12 probe 12 echo probe that will be small footprint and then you can work next to it okay i think in india most of the epicardial echoes are done by the cardiologists i think maybe it's oh i see yeah yeah it's, yeah it's a matter I just have to scrub in and do it <laughs> so, and we uh, usually put it in another I think sterile our, uh, i think perish have not there in ramachandra they do it our cardiac uh, anesthesia uh, team are very good in echo we routinely do echo for adult pediatric epicardial echo also they have been doing maybe jabba can uh, enlighten us how frequently you go yeah. jabba perisham it all in which thing yeah yeah most of the time the anesthetists they are good in trans esophageal also plus trans uh, epicardial and um, mm-hmm. many times we go and help out meaning we just go and watch for some second opinion that's it they are very good at that but uh, just one question i uh, um, unlike many other developed countries we don't see much of hypoplas probably they don't reach the centers um but i don't know whether shiva or any other center has many hypoplas because we hardly ever see hypoplas typical hypoplas mm, mm. i think yeah. they don't yeah. reach the centers maybe any other lot to do with the pediatric also i think jaba whether they refer they would like yeah. to refer or talk about the long term results short term in our setup which may get the family may get discouraged would like to not to proceed not to proceed any treatment that's about it few antenatal patients i have seen and uh, many times we say we give a choice one of the conditions where you could give a choice of uh, terminating the pregnancy or continuing to the patient uh, to the uh, parents and i think most of them choose to terminate Uh, yeah jabraj uh, one one of the uh, am i audible jabraj yeah 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 mm. one of the uh, <clears throat> problem is of course the lack of advocacy of all the pediatric cardiologists in a developing country like india against uh, multi stage procedures for hypoplastic left heart syndrome but it is also known that the eastern part of the world has more and more of hypoplastic right heart and the western part yeah. of the world has more and more yeah. of hypoplastic left heart uh, if you if you if you see the number of uh, fontans that are being performed in the united states of america quite a large number of them will be for hypoplast whereas in our part of the country there will be increasing numbers of pulmonary atresia intraventricular septum with rv dependent coronary circulations more of tricuspid atresias in general the the hypoplasia of the right heart is much more common on the west like eastern side of the world uh, that is one mm-hmm. uh, one difference having said that Uh, in the last 5 years or so i would say there is an increasing recognition of more and more hypoplastic uh, left hearts uh, because of very very aggressive fetal echocardiographic programs that are even available in the smallest villages the smallest towns of uh, places like tamil nadu and kerala so probably we 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 may see Uh, a slight increase in the number of hypoplasts uh, uh, in the <coughs> in the uh, upcoming years uh, because uh, we, because we, uh, we, we all know that quite a large large number of these uh, newborns they get lost within the first 24 to 48 hours but an antenatal detection and if the parents are not very keen on a termination then these babies probably will continue to be getting born in some of the centers uh, like in the last 5 to 10 years i probably see more and more of fetal echocardiography detections of hlhs and uh, possibly getting delivered compared to yeah. compared to the past yeah. fetal echo is so increasing what, in india yeah why i said was uh, i used to work in kuwait before at one point that is the only center for the whole country we had seven hypoplas in the unit and three more hypoplas outside the unit at the same time and mm. here in uh, we not seen many yeah. that yeah. was some so it's a good point that shiva was uh, making uh, yeah. about uh, more right hypoplast hypoplasty right right heart in in the east compared to the west possible we need to look into it <laughs> to, to pay attention to the existing data maybe you that may turn out to be true that's probably correct i've i've been told this by other other folks also 
oh, somehow we don't see that many hypocrites mm -hmm. from the eastern part. It's true. Especially pulmonary atresia, intact ventricular septum is far more common in the oriental population. The, the maximum experience mm -hmm. of pulmonary atresia perforations are with the people in Malaysia, Vietnam and all. Uh, uh, and it is little less in countries mm -hmm. like uh, India. And it is, uh, mm -hmm. it, it's relatively rarer in, uh, in uh, Europe and uh, uh, USA. So we have less yeah. of both. In the middle. <laughs> no, I, I, I think we have more number of hyperplastic, right? You, if you look at yeah. the number of functions that we are doing, quite a fair number of them will be for uh, smaller right heart structures. Uh, yeah, so yeah. The, we, know, we, we still are <laughs> probably one among the Eastern world. Okay. Yeah, Mr. Okay. Shall, shall we close, or uh, to Sure, sure. Can okay, we? Uh, very, very uh, an educative meeting. Thank you, Dr. Balaguru. Uh, though you came to Ramchandra, I missed you last time when you came. Looking forward to meet once the pandemic settles. We would love to have you ambitious and uh, let us do some good program in person. Sure. It's a great pleasure to watch you. And I don't know how I missed you in uh, Stanley. I was doing my MD oh, yeah. from 88 to 91. I was in Dr. N.P. Prabhakar oh, unit. When Chandra, oh, Madam, uh, oh, the, the PRC, everybody was there. Probably we would have bumped on each other. Uh, I think uh, yeah, maybe when we can recollect. Adult world and pediatric yes, world. Yeah, no, the Wellington world is very famous. Wellington what, yeah. And also the cardiology part, Sivaraman and group will be the ones coming and giving counsels yes, and advices for pediatric patients. So, um, yeah, I, we, we probably cross paths without realizing. Probably, probably. Uh, yeah, NSR was my mentor who guided me into cardiology, Dr. Sivarajan in Sivarajan. Mm, Sivarajan. Yes. And in fact, uh, Dr. Krishnamurti, the one usually frequently visited Wellington Ward those days. I used to come with him regularly on duty. And uh, mm -hmm. Pritam, the one who has organized all these things, is his son. So the next generation mm -hmm. of the turn is one of the budding great interventionists. I see. Very good. Life <laughs> flowing. Thank you. Jabba, you are putting the mask. It has been really. Um, uh, very, very interesting, very uh, very uh, enlightening for us to look at these procedures and uh, think and talk about hybrid procedures. Um, I thank uh, Dr. Balaguru primarily for uh, agreeing to talk to us and uh, giving this lecture. And um, uh, Dr. Preetham um, Bhubati uh, to be at the backbone to, for arranging this whole procedure and Dr. Ramya to be with us. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Sir. I learned something. Thank you all. Sorry. I will stop sharing. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much.